Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm a believer. I couldn't leave her if I tried. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss The Believers, which released in 1987. Based on the novel by Nicholas Cond, the screenplay from Mark Frost, and directed by John Schlesinger. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Martin Sheen's character, Cal Jameson. He has just recently suffered a devastating loss at home when his wife has died, and he has moved his son Chris and himself to Manhattan, where, as a therapist for police officers, he starts to uncover a mystery of child sacrifices going on in the city. As his investigation starts to deepen, he starts to realise not only does he have to protect his son, but he might also have the enemy closer than he thinks. So I was uh, going into this one pretty uh, blind, actually. Mm. I have to say, I was very surprised when this one came through as a as a recommendation for us to review. Yeah. So it was like an 80s horror movie that's got Martin Sheen in it that I've <laughs> never heard of. I've never seen this film. I was like, this, this could be a forgotten 80s gem of a film. Yeah. Uh, but the director, I did catch the name and I was like, I know I know this director. Yeah, yeah. And then immediately the Midnight Cowboy yeah. came to mind. And I was like, excellent. I'm sure we're going to be in for a good time with this film. Yeah. I, but like you, I, I went into this blind. I may have sneakily had a look at the wiki before I hit play, but I was like Martin Sheen in a, in a horror movie about like black magic kind of, I don't want to say voodoo, but kind of witchcrafty kind of weird stuff going on. And I, I got to also admit, I've not seen much of Martin Sheen's acting career. So he's probably got a lot of films that I've never, ever heard of. Like I've seen Apocalypse Now and I saw that bit in like Hot Shots where he passes his son. Um, and I've seen this now. So that's great. Um, but yeah, like the film... You know, yeah, massively under the radar. So you go into it and it starts off kind of strange because obviously he's just jogging down the street, you know, and it's early morning. The milkman's still around doing his rounds um, and he comes home and he enters his house and there's his wife um, and, and there's his son, Chris, uh, played by Harley Cross, who who I have to say was pretty outstanding. It was pretty in, decent. Yeah. In, this, in this movie as, as a young actor, you know, he really made me believe his relationship that he was having with with cal martin sheen um but yeah at the same time i like right off the bat like like i'm just gonna jump in before gary says anything like martin sheen spills milk in his kitchen and decides that he's going to use his sweaty socks that he's been jogging in to mop it up which is a big fucking no-no and you watch his wife walk and step in the milk I'm pretty sure in this shot as well, they're both stepping in, in the, the milk. milk. And I was like, who does that? Who does that? <laughs> really? Like, <laughs> nobody nobody spills something then stands in it to clean it up. But it's like, but we'd already kind of had the hint that the coffee machine was out of whack. You know, it was leaking and the, 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 there were sparks. And Chris points at it and says, Mum, Mum, look at the coffee machine. So Mum walks over and we watch her walk through the milk puddle to the coffee machine and while martin sheen's in the shower he the lights start flashing and he hears his son screaming and we realize that the wife has electrocuted herself or accidentally or purpose i don't <laughs> like yeah well like, yeah well, like we come out and we see her continuously being shocked by it yeah obviously paralyzed can't move and uh well it's fatal she she dies well, yeah, if you're going to stand in milk and mess with electrics, <laughs> that's what happens. Well, yeah, you know, that just brings me back to, I'm like, it's it's supposed to be this, this shocking opening that sets everything up. And I'm just <laughs> standing there like, who steps and spilled milk? <laughs> like, like an hour into the film, I'll be all set up and like, who steps and spilled milk? I, just was, I was thinking about it all the way <laughs> yeah, through the film. Oh, it's like, fine, okay, so we have this tragedy. Uh, we have this dramatic, of course, outburst and reaction to it. Um, and then we cut to them moving into a new apartment. Actually, no. It's one of those weird, heavy cuts where after after that happens, we cut to um, uh, this ritual 
being held. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's sacri- you know, animalistic sacrifices being made. It's over the credits, made. isn't it? It's over the credits, exactly. So I was like, okay, so we've been introduced to our family unit that's fractured and broken now. And now we cut to what I guess is going to be the antagonistic kind of force yeah. behind the film. Yeah. Um, now, this film is obviously depicting... Um, Santaria, yeah, uh, which I, I don't know very much about this religion, yeah, um, but it, it's supposed it's not supposed to be. I'll have the connotations with black magic and voodoo. Yeah, well, I was gonna research it, but like from the way the movie depicts it as well, it de- you've got the good side and the bad side. Sure, yeah, you know, and you've got like the the good side, which is that Santaria, and then you've got the bad side, which is like Bruhella or something, and it's. It's like worshipping to a god and asking and sacrificing animals and giving them kind of uh, trophies or, you know, sacrifices so that they'll bestow upon you blessings and stuff. Right. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. 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 And But it's, it's, it's also like heavily implied, like, like this whole opening over the credits as well, where we, we see th- this mum and dad and their son is very sickly and then we see another child and then they're getting ready to to sacrifice, but you, you it cuts again after that. You don't know who's been sacrificed at that point. And then we're in Manhattan. You know, uh, Chris is is in his new home, and, and the movers are moving all of his stuff in. And uh, Cal is, is sat in his office, and he's um, being a therapist to a police officer. And I couldn't remember the actor's name. I had to look him up, and it was uh, Jonathan Kent from the fucking uh, New Adventures of Superman with <laughs> Lois. And I was, I was looking at his face like, it's, it's, it's Superman's dad. Um, <laughs> but also their neighbor, um, Helen uh, Shaver, who plays Jessica Halliday, um, you know, her and Cal have started to make this great relationship. Did you recognize the actress? I did, actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tremors, too. She disappeared you know? off with Fred Ward last <laughs> yeah. time I saw her. Yeah. And, and they're, they're building up this budding relationship you know she's a neighbor she's an artist and you know we we also start to uncover as well that there's a a, a man a strange man has turned up at the airport it, it took me a while like i was <laughs> i had to search for like three separate pages on imdb and and wiki to actually find the actor's name uh, malik bowens who plays palo and he's got the weirdest fucking eyes like he hypnotizes the guy at the airport to let him through because he's got all of his his, his luggage. He's got all these ritualistic contraptions and devices. He's got this giant blade, yeah. sacrificial blade. Uh, but yeah, he just manages to dominate his mind and voodoo right on out of there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but the 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 timing as well. That I, I felt the pacing as well was a little bit off in the film um, because you know there there starts to be ritualistic child sacrifices going on yeah in... there's two fairly early on when the first hour of the film really. yeah yeah but it, like the, the the timings are so spaced up because we follow as well robert lagoya um who plays uh lieutenant sean mctaggart he's fantastic he's a fucking great <laughs> actor yeah. i mean he's he obviously I, I love him in scarface nice you yeah. know and he he turns up at this abandoned theater and he he comes across jimmy smith's um, who, who's playing Tom Lopez, this undercover police officer who's been working in this section of the city, trying to uncover what they're doing with these weird rituals. And Lopez is the one who's found this child's body. He's called up the cops and he's screaming off his head because he believes in the, the, the religion, I suppose, the magic. And they've taken his police badge. Yes. So he feels powerless. He also feels, you know, like he's vulnerable and he's he's you know waving the gun at all the other police officers as well yeah before he ends up holding it to his own head and they stop him from from suiciding uh but he's just like they control you they will get into your minds they know everything there's nothing you can do to stop them and uh and martin sheen's just like well he's he's confused by all this he's like clearly i've got my work to do now you know i'm a psychiatrist therapist i'm here to look after this guy yeah and uh it, 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 I think Jimmy Smith actually has some of my favorite scenes in the film. I think yes. he, he really, he really emotes, he really sells that he's just been through something traumatic and terrible that he can't quite describe. Yeah. So I don't really know whether his, I can't remember if his character knew much about the religion that he's kind of gone undercover and dabbled in, or whether it's just hit him that the, I guess the fantasy of the religion has become a reality, and so yeah. he, he's that's why he's acting this way. Yeah. Well, I mean, I 
don't fully believe or know or, or pretend that I know absolutely everything about obviously voodoo realistic black magic kind of Haitian stuff going on but from the things that I've seen over my 40 plus years like if they get hold of a personal item of you they can do curse weird, you, yeah they yeah. can curse you they can put weird spells on you so him emoting that they've got his shield you know his police badge which is incredibly personal to Lopez to Jimmy Smith and so they've got him by basically the nutsack and they can do whatever they want to him at any point um, and so him wanting to commit suicide is his only way out and they, he, he can't and then like you said when they, when Martin Sheen's talking to him in the hospital and he's just like they're gonna get me man you don't know what's going on and Martin Sheen at first doesn't believe it but when he returns home he starts to uncover that his maid Carmen who we'd actually seen uh, come across the theater with the police as well you know she's starting to put kind of um strange things around chris's bedroom to try to protect him as well well she, because she had come across this weird i don't know uh artifact that he had it was like yeah a, he'd found it, was it in a the, beaded shell yeah he'd found that in the um in the, the, the in the park, park yeah. where the first body had turned up and obviously there was also sacrificial remains left there as well yeah so um so she realizes exactly what it is and and steals it and takes it away from him. Yeah. And uh, so he has a complete breakdown and starts smashing things around the house. Uh, this new housewarming gift. Yeah. Uh, but we realize that Carmen had actually hidden another spell inside of it as well. Yeah. And that is when Martin Sheen's just like, "What is this? Here's your your earring that went missing." And yeah. She's yeah. like, "Oh, I'm so sorry. I cast a love, a love spell, spell on you on both." You. And they're both like, "Bullshit. We kind of got attracted to each other because." Chemistry, not some <laughs> voodoo magic man. That's ridiculous. And and we we're also following, like we said, Palo as well, like um in in his like I don't know, hidden locations and he's got, you know, Jimmy Smith's badge and he also you know we don't actually see him sacrifice the second child, but we see uh, Martin Sheen get called by McTaggart to come to the docks. Yeah. And when they get to the docks, they go down inside and they find this uh, boy's body. Well, the film does this like three or four police shots of the crime scene. Yeah. And I was just like, why did you do an, an extreme close up on the boy, the dead boy, who's obviously still alive and so breathing. he's breathing. I was like, why did yeah. you do an extreme close up for the <laughs> to the proof that he's not dead yet. <laughs> That's it. That was so quick. I mean, yeah, the gore levels that were non-existent. But there's a lot of blood. There's a lot of blood. But, but the film tries to imply. Yeah. It's like when they went to the morgue and it's just like, oh, you go see what happened to the body, and they pull the body out, and it's still bloody. The sheet's still bloody, and I'm like, I've seen a lot of horror movies. That's not so. When they lift up the sheet, both of them are like, oh my god, it's shocking, and I'm like, oh, I can see why why you did that movie. Mm -hmm. Um, but as as Cal um, starts to tr continue to try to have his life continue, um, you 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 notice things going on. So, for example, I, I really like the sequence where um, it was Chris's birthday. And like you said, he was so pissed off that he'd lost his necklace and, it, and, and his dad saying to him, look, just forget about it. But he's also angry because he doesn't want Jessica as his new mum. You know, and he thinks that his dad's moved on and he's forgotten about his mum. And it's like, well, OK, movie, how long have, how long since the opening did mum die? You know, at least when we like when we watched The Changeling, we knew it was at least a couple of months. But with this, it's like, oh, she's dead. Let's sell the house and move, you know, to yeah, start house. sleeping with the next door neighbor. <laughs> yeah. who happens to be the landlady. Right? <laughs> yeah. And you get that great moment where they walk out into the street and, and Chris is so angry that he doesn't want an ice cream and he just runs out into the road. Cars almost hit him. Martin Sheen chases him down the street. You get that great camera shot where he just grabs him. He just starts spanking his bum in the middle of the street. Damn it! No, 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 don't no! You I don't ever. want to enjoy him! Shut up and listen to me! Do you know you almost killed yourself? Martin Sheen went out on public and said, I just want to make sure everybody watching this film knows that he was heavily padded, <laughs> no harm befell him, and that they had a really good relationship offset as well. So. Yeah, <laughs> because it follows up when they when they get home. Chris comes storming in. It's his birthday. He storms all the way up the stairs, and then, and, and then Cal comes in, and he goes all the way up the stairs, and he comes across Chris, and he's just like, look, 
I'm really sorry. I love you. I'll always protect you. I loved your mother. I'll never forget her. But you've got to understand she's gone, you know, and it was and they hug and reconcile. And I was like, you know what? That's really working. That's yes. The chemistry between the actors here was really good. I think Martin Sheen shows a phenomenal amount of range throughout yes. this film from happy go lucky kind of family man to begin with. And to obviously the horror of losing his wife to then the rebuilding of his life to falling in love again and trying to raise a child whilst dealing with seeing these mutilated bodies whilst being introduced to this occult kind of religion yeah yeah so like his reign throughout this film over the two hours i think is fascinating to watch him yeah uh, he he really does capture your interest for the most part into what's gonna go on next however mm-hmm. i do feel like this film is like 45 minutes too long that's how it yeah. feels to me because even though we know like we as an audience know like, because the film told us with, before the title came up, like, what to expect, really, when it cut to this, you know, the sacrificial practices going on. Mm. But getting to any of sort of the, the thrills or the horror that this film is implying, the film takes forever to really build up to it. Yeah, it's like a really elongated mystery. It is, because we're, we're dabbling with sort of the police crime forensic stuff as mm. to where these bodies come from, what's the connections here, who's trying to cover stuff up. And, you know, it's one of those films where it's the secret society. You know, like the people in power already control everything. Yeah. And so you are just being puppeted along the ride so almost anything you know our, our protagonist goes through throughout the film is, is almost inconsequential because we know he's being puppeted all the way yeah so whilst the whilst cal is figuring stuff out and becoming more and more aware of this occult and its power and starting to believe that it's real it took him way too long to get there and to catch up with the rest of us watching the film yeah uh, and it sort of really sort of culminates in the scene where he gets invited then to this big banquet dinner. Because yeah. he's, he's been hounding this other author of one of the books of this religion. Yeah, He's Oscar, been shunning yeah. him, hiding away from him. But he manages to get hold of him, talk to him and get an uh, entry into this, this expensive function. Yeah, run uh, the the functions run by Harris Eulin, who plays uh, Robert Calder, and you you just know. I mean, Eulin is great. Uh, he was the fucking judge from Ghostbusters exactly, Two. Yeah. He was in Scarface as well with Lagaya, and I just immediately looked at him and went, "You're evil." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know that's what I mean about how predictable the film is. <laughs> yeah. It's that you, once you know the type of film it is, you see all the players get introduced, and you're like. You're the villain, you're the secret villain, and obviously you're the one that the film is telling us is the villain because you've got those crazy eyes. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Palo actually even turns up at this function and he, he kind of messes with um, Jessica's uh, mirror, her makeup mirror, while she's in the bathroom. And then he stands in the middle of the room and while they start doing some ritualistic music on the drums, he starts going through his kind of weird trancey dance and his eyes change. He starts kind of hypnotizing Jessica and tries to get her her necklace. But Cow steps in, you know, stops him and, and, they're, and they're separated. But Calder is kind of looking down at him like there's something going on there. And, uh, we, you know, we'd also been already introduced to Linda and Dennis who were friends or close acquaintances to cow and his original wife and so they love chris and they love hanging out with him and spending time with him as well but like like you said it was just like there's something weird about them you know because the film's not actually the film's not telling us that they love and they want to be with chris and take care of him but they're so close as well i'm like i you're, you're, you're freaking me out. I mean, unlike Richard Mazur's character, Marty, the fucking lawyer, <laughs> he was great. He was, yeah. <laughs> Anytime he gets a moment, he's performing magic tricks. Yeah. Like, what kind of lawyer are you? It's like a fun one. I was like, it, honestly, it was the one prediction I got wrong. Really? Spoilers, I thought the lawyer was clearly going to be the mastermind. I was, I was <laughs> no like, he's way. so joyful and so happy, you know? It's like, there's something, uh, I don't know if they've got it right here, but I was like, hell, I mean, it's the guy from It, so I'm like, it's, it's fine. It's Clark from The Thing, man. I love the conversation that he had with Martin Sheen, where they were wanting to sue the coffee company over the machine that killed his wife. And Martin, she's just like, I don't want my son to take the stand because obviously he has an eyewitness to it. And he's like, no, no, I won't do that, but we want to take him. And I'm like, you're going to sue a whole coffee company machine place 
just over one fucking machine when we all know the woman was standing in milk. <laughs> Get a load of this. Wow. <laughs> Ta-da! They also come across uh, Lopez's escape from uh, Bellevue, uh, I think, which is a mental ward, I think, in, in uh, Manhattan. And he's he's been put in there, but then he manages to escape. And uh, Lagaya is just like, look, Cal, if he calls you, we need to know straight away. So Cal's like, yes, I will. And as soon as Lopez calls him, he doesn't say anything. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but Lopez is like, look, you know, you need to meet up with me. I've got some real vital information. And while we're following Jimmy Smith's heading to this cafe, we're also following Paolo, who's doing the strange ritual on his badge. And that puts snakes into yeah. his stomach. You know, he, he's, he's just feeling in pain, all upset. And then, uh, yeah, he ends up having a breakdown, ends up stabbing himself to death. Yeah. And uh, and of course, yeah, Cal turns up, Police Taggart turns up. They they investigate and like, okay, he's he's dead. And uh, but I, I thought it was, I was just like, okay, clearly it's you know it's an implied. They've somehow managed to convince him that he's got snakes inside him. It's not really just psychologically, which is why he killed himself. But then when you see at the autopsy, yeah, yeah, you've got the intestines in the bowl, and yeah. there's snakes in there. Snakes I was in like, there. black okay, magic, bro. Yeah, it's fucking black magic. Guess it's real. Man, if I learned one thing from Baron Samadhi, it means that he can do anything. Oh, I know. He can dig it. Yeah, he can dig <laughs> it. And so with Lopez's death, you know, and, and the investigation deepening, you know, even uh, McTaggart, he gets taken out. And, and Jessica, she gets uh, like a boil start to grow on the side of her face. So, from her makeup uh, thing. Yeah. yeah. And so Cal has sent Chris off with... Dennis and Linda because he's going to go to the lake and he's going to ride a boat and he's going to have all this fun. Um, but Cal is supposed to meet them up in a couple of days and Jessica's hiding in her room, you know, and he gets called to meet up with McTaggart. And when he goes to see McTaggart, McTaggart can't move. He's yeah. stuck in his chair. <clears throat> he's got a gun pointed at the door as well. Yeah. Well, because he... He didn't believe in it either, but something is forcing him to not move yeah. from this. So chair. it's like it's just an it's it's you know a repeat basically. The film's kind of looped over um, Schmidt's character, and now yeah. it's happening to Tagger. So I'm just like, okay, like we get it. Like can Cal now please understand what's going on? But I thought it was great as well, especially when Jessica's face pops open and spiders start going out. I knew you'd freak out at this. Well, yeah, I mean, I just want to say before you show any footage, Ian, like, okay, it's like for anyone who's sitting comfortably right now, if you have a uh, fear of spiders, like <laughs> this scene is your worst nightmare and you may want to skip like five minutes of the video. I'm going to show it twice. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> Well, you can carry on, carry on, Ian. But I thought that was kind of a great effect, really, because it was real spiders. Practical, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, like, you can see that the makeup on her face is really just to hold her, but the actress having to sit there, I mean, I don't know if she was scared as well, she seemed it, you know, and they start crawling all over her face. You're just like, oh, my God, what the fuck? You know, but it, it goes hand in hand with the black magic that we'd seen with the snakes as well. You yeah. know, this is all trying to take out people close to Cal. And so Cal actually heads over. He, he sees her in her apartment freaking out. He races over there. He gets her to the hospital to be taken care of. Um, but he'd already called up Dennis and Linda to find out about Chris. And she'd lied to him saying, oh, no, no, Chris is out on a boat at the moment. He's busy. When actually we see the sun down on the dock and then we see Paolo there. And so you realize, oh, fuck. They're in on it as well. Oh, I didn't see that coming in. Well, yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> <Sorry, laughs> I literally, it was, felt so predictable. Yeah. Like, I just wish the film would, I, I don't know. It's like, I know it wants to build up that moment. Yeah. But it just, it, for me, it was so flat. I was just like, it's taking so long. Well, I was a bit surprised that she actually rang up again and tried to convince Cal that she'd made the mistake. Right. And she tries to tell him that something's actually, up. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, well, maybe she's not in on it. And they, I, sort of, I, I think she was, and I think having second thoughts. Yeah, I think she was really having second thoughts because, like this, the, the whole ending of the movie starts to kind of unravel everything that had been blown up. So, like the whole mystery gets to this point where, where Cal and and, and Marty, the lawyer, are heading over to the the, the house, 
And when they when they get there... I love that he can just call up his lawyer friend and he's like, hey, look, they've uh, abducted my son. They're evil voodoo cultists. Well, he, he, no, he, he doesn't know that at this point. Help. He's just, <laughs> yeah. It's more like, can you give me a lift to this <laughs> yeah, boat house because yeah. I don't have a fucking car. And when he sees the limos parked in the trees in the background. That's it. He's like, well, they shouldn't that's, be there. That's what makes Marty stay. Yeah, but yeah. It's, but it's when he gets there and... You know, he doesn't come. He doesn't initially come across her body at first, but he meets up with Dennis. Dennis is like, "Oh, the wife's gone to the market," and I'm like, Psh, "Bullshit, motherfucker! I know you're evil." And um, he gives Cal a drink, which immediately in the multitude of movies I've, I've watched, I was just like, "You shouldn't be drinking that." Yeah. Oh, it's drugged. Well, <laughs> and Dennis, which I thought was a great sequence where his voice starts to distort because of the drugs. Yeah. Explains everything. So what we'd seen in the title sequence was actually Dennis and Linda. Yeah. And and they had sacrificed their own son in that sequence to not only give them power and riches, but to also allow Palo, who's the little boy from the opening sequence as well, to grow up and to perform keep performing this ritual for other people and so it also turns out because Laguire had well just before he'd been kind of voodoo or black magic or whatever had happened to him he'd gotten the information from the uh, which had been buried about Calder's son who had OD'd at the age of eight and like Cal was like, well, we, he doesn't say he, well, well, he didn't say he died at eight. He just said he overdosed. And then it's like 30 minutes later, we find out that he was only eight when we find the classified buried documents. Yeah. It's like, yeah. All right, so, yeah, they've infiltrated the police and everything else. So they can hide evidence and documents and they can do all these things. Yeah. But I was just like, so what are they actually after? They're like, they've got power and resources. And they keep saying we have power so that we can crush our enemies uh, wherever they may be. And it's like. Who are your enemies? Yeah, we, like the, their their goals or their plans are not explored in any way. We'll just introduce these people and go. They're they're wealthy, rich people, and they want power and they need more power. Yeah. Like, they don't need more power. Why are you involved in this now? Why? I was like, oh, your son was selected. So because he found the thing in the in the park. Yeah. I was like, well, Cal doesn't want the power. So why are we going to sacrifice him to give him the power? Well, are they, they gonna? That's it. They start to force. Cow to try to kill his own son. I mean, part of the, to give him the power to be part of the family. I was like, well, surely you will know he's going to reject this. Yeah, that's it. Because in my mind, I'm like, so I, I, the only way I can understand it is that they need the father to sacrifice the son to have the spell work for all of them. Doesn't know that's what how it's going to work. We yeah, I really know. Um, but the, the Dennis is also just trying to convince Cal that this is what he wants. You know, oh, your wife's dead, and if you sacrifice your son, you'll get rich, and everything will be okay after after a couple of months. You 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 will have all this money and power, and every now and again, we just have to sacrifice an, another child somewhere because we see that mum and dad, don't we? We we initially saw them after their son had been killed. Yeah, and then it turns out later on that they'd actually intend. You know, done yeah. that in with intent because they wanted more power. So everybody turns up at the boathouse, and Martin Sheen's like, "Oh fuck this shit," and gets uh, gets up, races upstairs, looks for Chris, can't find him. So he throws himself out of a window, which was great. Um, and he heads to the boathouse, which then it allows him to come across um, the uh, Dennis's wife's body, and he gets taken out, and then he gets taken to this industrial fucking building, building yeah. site. <laughs> In, in That's still the, under construction, or I'm like, you need this place to fucking say you could have done it at the house. <laughs> this is what their power has brought them in. Yo, yeah, oh, right, okay. <laughs> and that's it. They're all stood there, and 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 Cal seems to be in this trance or drugged or whatever, and he's getting ready and they're giving him the knife. I mean, I, I thought that shot where like he looks down and it the, the 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 bed was empty, then it was a goat. And then he sees his son. That's right, yeah. You know, and so they're just forcing him to try to take up the knife to sacrifice his son. And he looks up and he sees Clark with the gun. Sorry, Richard Mazur, the fucking <laughs> lawyer, go past with the gun. And I'm like, oh, he's going to fucking save the day. And <laughs> with the lawyer? Yeah. He's going to turn up and save the day? Yeah, man. Cause they, they, I mean, the film didn't imply, but it, it did seem like they were really close friends. Yeah. Yeah. With with whatever they'd been through, even the short scenes that we'd seen, they were they were really close. And so you know, just as he's about to bring the knife down onto his son, you know, his son's waking up like dad, and so he overcomes the spell and he stabs Dennis right in the gut. And you're like, oh shit! And then that's when fucking 
the lawyer starts unloading into the crowd. Yeah, firing popping headshots. Shots. Yeah. You can see people going down, spitting blood here and there. Everyone's running around screaming. Yeah. But then Marty gets gets chased away. Well, he gets he keeps hearing uh, Chris calling out. Yeah. Uh, but he's really being tricked. Yeah. Um, and eventually he ends up um, he getting... Gets, he gets a blow dart to the yeah, back. Yeah, to the which back. I, which, is, which, I, which knocks him down. Yeah. And so when it looks like he's done for, he ends up pulling out a lighter and then... Basically blasting fire in his face. Yeah. Which melts his face right slightly. Right into Palo's face yeah. and it just sends him off. And, and the lawyer Before, dies. Yeah, Marty dies. Well, actually, we, he goes down, but we never actually confirm he's dead. We never actually go back to find out. No. Yeah. He's just left gone. Well, I mean, the fact that we never see him the rest of the ending of the movie, I'm like, yeah. That, I would have liked some good. closure for this lawyer. I would have liked, <laughs> but I, I really got the idea it was like a poison yeah, dart that yeah, took him out. Yeah. And Palo's got his face burned and Cow is chasing after Calder, who has stolen Chris because if he sacrifices him, then they get their magic or something. Right. You know, but you get this kind of cool confrontation where Cal's on the outside of a cage and Calder's on the inside of the cage with Chris and Chris is like dad come and help me and they he, he uses the sacrificial knife to unlock the cage and he gets inside the cage and shanks him and then yeah the two of them finally <laughs> yeah. shanks him and, and like, he saves the son ah. but but it's not over yet yeah <laughs> Palo's still alive and uh, even though he's horribly disfigured he still manages to overpower Martin Sheen uh, and then his attention is drawn to Chris. And so Chris is summoning him over. He's calling him over. And, of course, as an audience, we realise there's a big gap yeah. over this construction area. And, whoa, there he goes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like typical villain. Fall from a great height. Man. I rewound that section <laughs> three times just to hear that. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it was, I, it was I one of those. to it three times. Let's, let's do it again. <laughs> 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 Woo! Woo! <laughs> and he lands on those spikes. I was like, yeah. that was the greatest fucking sound. He sits up for a second. He's like, no, I'm fucking dead. It's like, well, the beauty wasn't going to get you out of that one, was it? <laughs> I got a bit of trivia here for you. Okay, yeah. Uh, you know the, the child actor. You know this is the uh, uh, this is the third consecutive time in a movie he's been abducted or kidnapped. Really? And after this, it would happen to him one more time as well. <laughs> uh, the first one was. Um, where are the children from 1986? Okay, yeah. Then he was abducted again in uh, Someone to Watch Over Me in 87. <laughs> then The Believers also in 87. And then Cohen and Tate in 1988. Wow. So, but if you see this kid in a movie, <laughs> lock him down. Because yeah, he's going <laughs> missing. I mean, I was a little bit sh freaked out by this ending. I think I kind of understand it, but I'm, I'm wondering what your perception is on it. Because... You know, he, he gets Chris, they, they get outside of this, this rundown un industrial building, and then it cuts. It doesn't say a couple of months later, but I mean, I get the idea. It's got to be at least six months, maybe a year later, because Cal's bought himself a big German Shepherd dog to protect him. You know, he's moved out into the country with Jessica and Chris. Jessica seems to be at least four or five months pregnant. Yeah. Um, Chris is calling her mum. You know, they're all happy, but the dog starts to kind of notice something's weird in the barn. So Cal heads out there to the barn for like what seems to be the like the first time he's ever gone out there. And then he climbs a ladder to go up to another level inside the barn. And when he gets up there, he finds him finds a shrine. But sacrificed goats and chickens and rabbits and fruit, but yeah. it's covered in flies and yeah, and so there's the biggest altar of protection. Yeah, Jessica seems to have been doing it herself so that she can protect the family. And the film freeze, freezes on the end on Cal kind of staring at her. And so I was wondering what your interpretation was. Because for me, like, she didn't believe it at first during the movie. And then they... Until she was cursed, yeah. Yeah, but they also went with that Oscar guy to put, like, a protective spell on Chris and the family. Yeah. And where he'd slice the chicken. So after seeing the spiders climb out of her face, did she start to believe? And that's why she's so. doing it? Yeah. Or, or was, like... 
Or was she in on it? <clears throat> like, judging by the end, like, her final gaze at him mm. tells me, like, turned into a villain. And now he's kind of, you know, he's he's now going to have a child with this woman who's now completely taken over by yeah. this voodoo black magic stuff. Whether, because, like, you know, like you mentioned earlier, like, when um, he's got that voice when he's been drugged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, for me, it also sounds like it's multiple voices talking through at once. Like, somebody yeah. somewhere else's mind, you know, body controlled and talking through him. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of like the impression I got with her at the end was that... She's been possessed so, by somebody else. Yeah, Body yeah. swapped somehow from, you know, I don't know. Because it also made me wonder as well, if she's pregnant, does that mean that they intend to kill and uh, yes, sacrifice yes. Well, the, the child, child for, for, for more power? Protection exactly. And power, so for which... the, like his turnaround look at the end is like, this isn't over, it's never going to be over now. Yeah. Whether he's been marked, she's been marked... <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those endings which just goes, this horror is never going to end. Yeah. But for me, I was like, yeah, it is. It is. The film's over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ian, do you have any favourite scenes from the film? I own, I honestly only had uh, two, maybe even three at a push. Um, my first favourite scene was watching that woman stand in the milk at the beginning of the movie. Honestly... Warnings, people. Got a milk foot fetish. <laughs> Don't ever fucking stand in any kind of liquid while messing with electrics. Ever. <laughs> don't. I mean, just don't, don't. If you're going to clean something up, don't fucking stand in it. Lisa, no. Oh, my God, no. Just don't touch it. Don't touch it. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, my second favorite scene uh, was Marty. Like, he was great. Like, I know he's only in it a little bit, but, like, the whole office sequence with him and Martin Sheen, it really, really kind of started to make me believe, like, there was a friendship there. And yeah. so then when he he's there at the end, I'm like, oh, this guy's going to help. You know, like, yeah, you're, you're right. It, it could have easily had just been ch changed where Marty was actually a bad guy. But Cal needed somebody from the outside to help him, you know, because he was kind of powerless. You know, Laguire had been taken out. Jessica had been taken out. The only other person there was Marty and so he just starts fucking blasting um, and that fucking noise <laughs> Woo! that was like three four five I'll watch that Woo! it was all a loop yeah <laughs> Yeah, I didn't have too many favourite scenes either, but I, I did write down as well the uh, the electrocution scene in the kitchen. <laughs> it's like, damn. Second favourite scene would probably be Chris's meltdown, his birthday meltdown. Oh, from nice, yeah. His, his tantrum in the toy store. Yeah. Uh, to watching that, that brand new truck get obliterated underneath the taxi yeah. uh, as he storms off. And then the uh, reconciliation after the spanking in the street. I was like, yeah, there was some good acting that there. That was great, yeah, yeah. Spiders growing out of the, the, the spot. Absolutely disgusting. Yeah, sorry for repeating it, but it, it's memorable. It's not favourite, but it's goddamn memorable. Yes. Nightmare stuff. Marty the lawyer coming back to save the day. I was just like, I was in disbelief. I was like, I was sure you were going to be another one of these dickheads, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, so very, very happy uh, there. And obviously disappointed that he kind of died and no one cared yeah except us yeah except us yeah. <laughs> yeah i also want to say poor carmen the housekeeper yeah like she was the one who was aware of of, of the evil's presence in the city yeah she was the one who was um taking away cursed artifacts blessing them if she could yeah and leaving protective spells and she's trying to help chris yeah and she ends up losing her job and she's pleading with cow like i'm trying to protect you i'm trying to help you and she gets sent home fired i was like she was right all along. Yeah, I, I was like, well, maybe, maybe right. Maybe um, Jessica got hold of Carmen because I was like, Jessica, how was she going to make all of this? She's like, how many months pregnant? That's it, you know? yeah. So I'm like, it's Carmen come back for revenge. Carmen's <laughs> back. <laughs> I do. Believers too. <laughs> Ian, do you recommend the film? I kind of do. I mean, it... it it was weirdly paced and there were some things that completely took me out of like the scary aspect of the movie. But I I likened this movie to maybe Rosemary's Baby, uh, maybe Kill List. Uh, there's probably a lot of other black magic kind of home invasion type movies where families are being tormented by something and it turns out that actually their family is all in on it. Um, but, like, if you're into Martin Sheen, like, if you really like him as an actor and you've never seen this one, or you like movies that involve around black magic, 
I, I, like I said, I want to say voodoo, but I don't think it's not voodoo. voodoo it's not. It, we just use it because it's a good coverall. Yeah, it's like, you know this Haitian kind of magic, kind of sacrificial cult, kind of witchcrafty things. Then yeah, you might really really enjoy this movie. The pacing kind of seems a bit off in places, but Martin Sheen saves it, and especially the actor uh, Harley Cross who plays Chris. He's really stand out, especially as the little kid. It's not the best movie of the 80s, but certainly not the fucking worst, Spookies. Yeah, I'm um, not going to be recommending The Believers, as I found the film overlong, disjointed, predictable, and unsatisfying as a whole. I'm not saying it's a bad film. The production quality is fairly good. It's got some decent effects, and there's some occasional flair of good cinematography, and it's Pretty damn good performances from all the cast involved. Martin Sheen was captivating to watch. You know, the drama of losing his wife, seeing everything unravel as he understands the cult's beliefs that they're real, and as he, as he becomes more desperate, Sheen shows great range here. The story, for me though, it felt muddled. You know, the pacing was way too slow, and the thrills were lacking. The film doesn't really deliver on the horror that much, unless you are arachnophobic, <laughs> or into, you know, the cult, secret society type of genre. The villains in the film were also fairly weak, disappointing. Mm. You know, there was plenty of suspense and build-up, but very little payoff. So yeah, I'm not recommending from personal preference. I, I don't tend to enjoy films in this genre. You know, the secret cabal, the voodoo, black magic cult... Uh, type movies, though Angel Heart and The Skeleton Key came mm, to mind as, yeah. as great, uh, but I didn't find great here. Maybe give this one a watch, though, if you are a horror fan. It's considered a classic. It's a hidden and forgotten gem from the 80s. Nothing can stop them. No one can help you. They know who you are. Whee! <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. <laughs> <laughs>